I think Asia is the future. With it come certain responsibilities that are key to overall human success. With it, obviously, is the nature of what we're going to do with the environment. There's a question of where society is going to move forward. And I think Asia is going to become key in handling those issues in the future. In the past, the USA had a tendency to be a leading culture in the Western world. Who knows? Maybe in the future, a shift of power towards Asia will make China take over that position from the USA. Even though China's economy will keep growing and so will its influence in the near future, I think in 20 years China will not be as powerful as it is today due to the rise of other economies such as India, Indonesia, Brazil and Nigeria. Although undoubtedly China will be among the most powerful countries, there will be many more countries whose interests China will have to reckon with. My major concerns about the shift in power are mostly that us as a Western society aren't very educated and we don't really know a lot about the norms and the culture in, for example, China. And I believe that we don't really know what such a shift in power might have as an implication for us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Li Xing and welcome to this session. Well, the, you know, the stories about innovation and the uh, uh, new innovative power of China hit the paper every day. I'll cite you a few numbers. Half of the words AI unicorns are Chinese. The online payment in China now, now amount to about 19 trillion US dollar, while its GDP is 13 trillion US dollar. And the world's fastest super supercomputer with 10.65 million CPU core is in a center in a southeast city that no one has ever heard of. Well, it's called Wuxi, by the way. And China has the world's first aerial passenger drone, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. But when we talk about China, there is often a yes, but moment. Yes, a lot of patents, but are they really useful? Yes, China is innovating, but how much of that is indigenous and how much, how much of that is borrowed overseas? And yes, China benefited tremendously from getting into, uh, incorporating into the world system, but how much China is giving back, and how much of a role the state is playing, the private sector is playing, and also the startup, especially the capital, is playing in that. So with that, we're very fortunate to have a super capable uh, panel today to discuss this and all the truth and myths about China's innovative power and the role of the capital. I will quickly introduce our panelists and we'll uh, get directly into the discussion. So sitting right next to me is Freeman Shen, the founder and CEO of Wima, WM Motor, an electric, electric car startup. He actually, WM is a German name. Yep, uh, after the word Weinmeister. But Meister, yes. I'll, I'll tell you the story <laughs> later. Yep. All right. And then the lady in the middle, uh, she gave an insight session already yesterday at St. Gallen. Uh, Ms. Freya Bimish, Chief China Economist of uh, Funtun Macroeconomics. And last but not least, uh, the gentleman on the far left side is Piyush Gupta, CEO of DBS Group, H, uh, headquartered in Singapore. So let's get right started. I want to have a quick round with our panelists that what is China truly? Do you believe China is truly an innovator today? And if yes, what's behind it? If no, what's lacking? Start with Freeman, probably. Oh yeah, definitely. I truly believe you know if if China is not a truly innovator, there's no company called WM Motors. <laughs> um, yeah, when I found the company, believe it or not, um, I talked to many of my friends in U.S. Uh, I live in U.S. over 12 years, uh, and a lot of my friends uh, in Europe. Uh, I spend. Uh, over 50% of my time in Europe for over seven and a half years. Uh, most of my people think, uh, most of my friends think I'm crazy because create an uh, electric company, initial car company. Look in Tesla, 15 years now, um, still losing a lot of money and uh, still trying to survive. But when I talk to the friends in China, most of them think, yes, there's so many new te technology coming, there's so many possibility coming, and uh, why not? Um, and uh, the, the company name is called Weidmeister because um, I, I named the company actually on the other side of the river, uh, on the other side of the Lake Constance. Uh, I have a very close um, German friend. Uh, he was a uh, very senior executive in Volkswagen. Um, <coughs> I truly believe on the engine car, uh, on the uh, uh, ICE, we call it internal combustion engine world, uh, the German is world championship, but electric vehicles, who knows, right? Uh, when I named the company, I think 
we want to become uh, one of the uh, largest electrical car company in the world, we've got to be named that in German language because we need to let our German friend know that. <laughs> So, uh, so I call the company Weidmeister. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, they don't allow me to register that word. So I have to pick the two words, WM Motors. Mm -hmm. stands for Weidmeister. Right. Um, <laughs> so to your question, yes, we believe China is the true innovator. Uh, I already uh, deliver thousands of my car on the road. Um, it's very different, a lot of new technology. Um, without the uh, um, uh, innovative spirit there, I don't think uh, the company will even survive. All right, so you're a living example of the, uh, the innovation power in China. Fuya, what's your view? Well, hopefully I can talk about this from, from the macro perspective. Um, absolutely, China is an innovator already, um, and it will continue to be an innovator. Um, Japan has done it before China, Korea has done it before China, and, and the, the economic model is, is quite similar. Um, so what we see in China is that there's this huge flow of savings um, out of income in each period, and that has to go somewhere. It can be sent abroad in the form of, of exports, but in terms of the investment domestically, a, a, massive, a massive flow of savings is conducive, of course, to um, is a driver of, of fast investment growth, and that helps in pushing out the technology frontier. So yes, China will be at the, uh, is already towards that, that, that frontier and will continue to be at that frontier. But, sorry, <laughs> but um, it, Japan, if we take Japan as, as, a, as a good precedent, what we saw over the course of the last 20 years was that Japan failed to tackle its, its debt problem. Um, and over that period, it did continue to be productive but the, the, the branding of the goods and the types of goods that were being produced um, were not those that were desirable. So there was a time when if I wanted an electronic product, I would buy, uh, if I wanted a music player, I would buy a Sony. Now I have a Japanese car, but I don't have a Japanese anything else. Um, and that's, that's a huge shift. It's, it's not necessarily about just the quantity of goods that, 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 that a, com a country is able to, to churn out um, as a result of the investments that it makes. It's about that creative spark. And at this stage, as an economist, I almost feel the knee-jerk reaction to, to apologize because I'm talking about something that's not immediately quantifiable, but prefacing anything with an apology is, is probably a destruction of human capital, so I'm not going to go down that path. Um, instead, what I want to say is that the overall um, social and political environment, I think, matters um, in, in terms of the creative process. Uh, reminiscent of, of the, the comments that Professor Linda Hill was making yesterday and what some people of, of the International Student Com Committee have been saying about friction and how from friction you get, you get uh, new ideas. And, and if there's a very, uh, there's a very um, closed down political system, then, then you, end up having a, you, you end up closing down that political system further down the chain or in the business realm as well. So that's, that's, my, that's my butt. Uh, and my, my, my couple of, of concerns in terms of chi China's innovative pro process. All right, so also pay attention to the culture and the institutions. Uh, Piyush, what's your view? Well, I'm going to make it three for three. You can see how innovative he was in naming his company. Um, it tells you there's a lot of creativity uh, in, in China. I think if you ask me, is China inventive? Is there a lot of uh, new invention in China? I think that is yet to be. Uh, to your point, China is the second largest file of all patents today. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's a lot of invention going on, but even that is changing. So the number of engineers and the number of uh, fundamental foundational research happening in China today is extraordinary. But in terms of innovation, bringing uh, products and solutions to market, uh, new ways of doing things, leapfrogging, and finding fundamental different solutions to problems, China, there's no doubt in my mind in the last decade there's been no country which has been as prolific in innovation and ideation as China has. It's true, you talked about drones, 70% of the world's drone market shares with DJ. Uh, the biggest challenge between the US and China today is not trade, it is 5G, IoT, and Huawei. And the fact that the US and the whole world is worried about Huawei just tells you about how innovative and how forward-looking uh, uh, Huawei has been. The biggest uh, sales of smartphones today, Xiaomi, Vivo, um, are Chinese phones and they're not cheap. Uh, it's not just because they're cheap, it's because they're really super phones. The smartphones have all the capabilities and all the features that you get on Apple at a fraction of the price. So uh, industry after industry you can find that the Chinese are beginning to bring solutions to the market which are differentiated. In our own industry, 
Uh, I have to tell you, we run the largest bank in Southeast Asia. We are fairly advanced and sophisticated digitally. Uh, I worry a lot more about Alibaba, WeChat, Ping An, China Merchant than I do about Apple or Google or JP Morgan. Uh, and that just tells you the nature of the, the capacity of the Chinese financial sector and what they've done and transformed is just in a different league. Hmm. Yeah. Perfect for setting the stage, and we'll come back to a lot of the uh, points we just mentioned. But let's take the grander view, the macro view first. How is Chinese economy doing and in terms of the innovation and the capital for powering the innovation when the economy is doing well and when the economy is not doing so well, where we'll find the engines? Freya, please. Um, it would be remiss of me to plow ahead without giving a kind of a base case as to what I think, whether there'll be a trade deal in the immediate future. Perhaps you can tell by uh, my attire that I am dressed for <laughs> the, the death of the international um, trading system. Uh, <laughs> but I, and Piyush was asking me about this when we were behind the stage. Uh, he asked me, why did you take off your, your, your somber black high heels, which are appropriate for the situation, and put on your, your sparkly gold trainers? Um, it, it, was a, it was a moment of, uh, of rebellion and uh, of, of dissent. Um, and perhaps if I can offer a, a, a ray of hope through my, <laughs> through my foot attire, um, it's to say that I think that there is potentially in the, in the short run um, some narrow path back towards uh, towards a, a trade deal being reached. Um, I won't go into the great de detail of why that might be, the, might be the case in the short run, and I certainly have grave misgivings over, over the trajectory over, over the long term because I think the structure of the Chinese economy is not going to change, and those, um, those issues that Martin Wolf was, was uh, addressing as to the, the, the legitimate concerns of the US over certain Chinese uh, practices and the structure of the Chinese economy, that's going to be with us for a time. But in the short run, my ray of hope is the weakness of the Chinese economy, to come back to your, to your point. So I give you a hope and then I knock it down again. <laughs> um, and the, the weakness of the Chinese economy, I think in the, in the first quarter, markets got a little bit ahead of themselves. Uh, the data is very thin in the first quarter because of Chinese New Year. There's not that much data that's actually published. So markets move a lot on, on, um, on, on survey data and, and data that's very distorted. Uh, and, and at the, the particular moment in time, liquidity conditions are intensely tight. Um, and that means that, that you get these kind of big, big moves and, and sell-offs and people, um, people, uh, people read a lot into, uh, into, um, into bad news. What we've seen in the first quarter is that there started to be a little bit of a loosening of, of liquidity conditions and, and markets have sort of taken that and, and, and run with it. But in terms of, of how, um, how weak the Chinese economy is at the moment, uh, we have our own indicators of, of real GDP growth, and that shows that uh, growth is, is much weaker than the, the authorities, the official, um, uh, official data suggests. And that really is a result, partly, yes, of, of the tariff hikes that were, were undertaken um, last year, but also of the, of the the tightness of liquidity conditions and the de the, the de-risking and deleveraging campaign that's gone on um, since midway through 2016. So, in terms of where we are, we're going from here. Uh, one of my favorite leading indicators is is um, M1 growth, which is currency in circulation and and demand deposits, and that uh, tends to lead GDP growth by about uh, three three quarters, about nine months. Um, so that peaked on a three-month annualized basis halfway through 2016 at above 20%, and it, at the end of last year was, was negative. So that tells you how strong the, 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 the policy tightening has been um, and gives you an impression of how, how, how weak the economy is at the moment and uh, amid those liquidity, tight liquidity conditions, tariffs hurt even more. Um, but the, the stimulus that has been undertaken since uh, last year, or since early last year, should be enough to, to give us a, a rebound in, in the second half, as long as we don't deteriorate into out-and-out into out trade war. To give you a bit of context, just if I can finish on, on this side of things, uh, the, the stimulus that has been undertaken uh, last year in terms of the, the monetary policy, conventional monetary policy side of things, is about half the size that uh, was undertaken in 2015-2016. 
and, and the, the fiscal policy side of things is about three quarters the size if you include all of the off-balance sheet um, side of things uh, as well. The, the recovery in 2017 was very strong. Um, so even if we do have a smaller stimulus, that means there's enough room for, for a, a recovery. We should also note that the transmission mechanism, both of, of fiscal policy and of monetary policy, has changed, and that, that means that the lags are longer and that, there, that there's less of a response from the economy. But we're still, um, if out-and-out -out trade war is avoided, still reasonably confident that we should see a recovery in, in the second half. Um, uh, if trade war is not avoided, then all bets are off. <laughs> Well, let's ask, actually, the player in the market. Freeman, do you worry about the trade war? Is that affecting you? Well, yeah, uh, yes and no, but uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think we should talk the details because we don't have any friend from U.S. on the stage. It's not fair, right? <laughs> Only the China voice. Um, but um, um, the, the, uh, uh, the overall car market has been extremely slow this year. Um, the, um, you know, out of the total consumption in China, um, about 10% is from, over 10% from uh, the uh, uh, car buying, you know, uh, real estate it's not considered as uh, a purchasing, uh, it's, it's more investment. Um, the, uh, the overall car purchasing has been very slow first quarter this year. Uh, however, the good news is for electric vehicles, we we're still growing very quickly. Um, probably the growing curve is not as, as aggressive as what we wanted, but uh, uh, still growing. And I think the government will find a way, uh, the more uh, tension between the trade, I, I believe, the government would do more things to boom in the local economy and uh, encourage people to uh, consume and buy. And obviously, car would be the uh, number one target. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a st stage China switch from Euro 5 to Euro 6 uh, for the environmental purpose, uh, which uh, will, uh, will f help the um, consumer buying a, a more good quality, especially electric vehicles. So we think the second half would be, I uh, agree with the fair, yeah, the second half would be much more better than the first half of the year. So the answer to uh, trade war, actually domestic answer, would be beefing up the domestic consumption with more supportive measures. And also, uh, Freya mentioned about the liquidity and the deleveraging campaign as a big factor in uh, slowing down the economy. Do you agree, Pirush? And do you think it's necessary? Well, yes, I, I, I agree. Actually, I'm going to focus on the shoes, Freya, so the, <laughs> or maybe even your hair, so the two hands. <laughs> I think there's some bright lights. Uh, I think there's no question that China macroeconomy is uh, slow, um, and I think the data points Freya talked about are true, but uh, you've got to put it in context. Number one, I think China is very successfully shifting its economic model from a manufacturing export-driven economic model to one more geared towards domestic consumption. We look at the share of services in the GDP and the share of consumption in the GDP. The trend lines are very clear. Uh, and that speaks well for a long-term structural shift. I think uh, the relative share of exports in China's GDP has been coming off. And within that, even though the US is a big trading partner, the relative share of the US in China's exports has also been coming off. I think that's important to uh, recognize. Uh, I do think, as you know, we, we, we talk to people on the ground, uh, the first round of tariffs, interestingly, uh, did not result in a massive uh, shift in supply chains out of China for one very simple reason. Those supply chains are very sticky and the alternatives are very few. So if you want to manufacture a refrigerator, maybe you can, but if you want to manage and manufacture an Apple phone, it's not easy to find those component parts anywhere else. And to recreate the supply chain for the electronics sector is a two to four year activity. It's not an overnight kind of activity. So it, by and large, what the commentary reflect is true, uh, what happens when you put tariffs on this, the US consumer winds up paying. To some extent, there's a margin squeeze in the suppliers and some intermediaries, but by and large, the US consumer winds up paying. Interestingly, many of our clients, when you speak to them, say, what happens in the medium term? Do you shift supply chains out of uh, China? Uh, I think the answer is perhaps yes, at least the incremental marginal investment people are wary about putting into China, but a lot of it actually goes into the region. So Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, even India are likely beneficiaries of that shift of the supply chain. Now, in some ways, that's not uh, unhelpful to China because China's uh, participation in intra-Asia trade has continued to rise dramatically. Uh, and therefore, if you think about intra-Asia trade, people in the earlier session said trade is not growing. Well, intra-Asia trade is growing. Um, we see that in our own trade finance book at the bank. It's grown 10x in the last 10 years, in the last decade. Uh, so I think there's some opportunity uh, from that. To your specific question, 
I think the third big uh, um, silver lining is this. I think the Chinese uh, President Xi and the administration have been very focused on recognizing the weakness in the system, which is excess leverage and too much debt and overcapacity in some industries. And so they've been very focused on trying to squeeze out the capacity and squeeze out excess liquidity in the system. Uh, people say is there a risk of systemic debt crisis in China. Um, I don't think there's a systemic risk today, but there's certainly a lot of idiosyncratic risk. There were 150 bond defaults last year, uh, about $20 uh, billion of bond defaults, and the pace of default this year is only increasing. Uh, therefore, the focus on deleveraging, tightening, squeezing is deliberate, and it is to try and cure the ills of the Chinese financial system, and frankly, that's not a bad thing. For several years, everybody has asked the Chinese to do that, and so they are trying to do that. Uh, the truth, though, is that in a controlled economy and a controlled political system, uh, the train doesn't go one way. You have to calibrate. So you take two steps forward, you take one step back. In the last two or three quarters, particularly because of the tensions with the US, they have eased off on the liquidity. They've pushed some more liquidity to the markets, they've created some more stimulus, but at the same time, they're still letting some of the weaker companies default uh, in parallel. So I think it is required. I think it is a good thing. And I think as they continue to open up the markets and financial markets liberalization, you will see more of this. Mm. You mentioned that part of the effort is dealing with the weakness in the system, especially the debt crisis, many of that actually concentrated on the state-owned uh, institutions or the state-owned companies or uh, bought by the local governments as well. That's actually uh, another topic I want to zoom in. How do you compare the state-owned sector and the uh, private sector? I will use some numbers and share with you all that the just to have a measure, uh, measurement of how vibrant the private sector is as opposed to the uh, state-owned sector. So the private sector use 40% of the resources in China, contribute to 50% of the tax, 60% of GDP, 80% of employment, and 90% of new employment. So where is the state? Wh wh what's the next step for the uh, state enterprise reform, Piyush? Well, um I think when you talk about the state sector, you still got to unbundle it into two. One is the local and municipal government agendas, and a large part of the debt, including the projects that have been done, have been done in the local municipal governments. A lot of the bond issuances, the off-balance sheet and shadow banking, all goes into that sector. Then secondly, you have the, the, the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, uh, as you call them. And there are a lot of weaknesses in that sector as well. But I would argue that there's some parts of that sector uh, which are not as bad as the municipal and local government uh, uh, sector itself is. Uh, in the SOE sector, again, there's a lot of overcapacity. Steel is, uh, you know, was a challenge. Shipbuilding was a challenge. So there are a lot of sectors, parts of the sector which are obviously um, uh, not in very good shape. Uh, but there are some companies which are very good. So you can't uh, color everything with a single brush. You take China merchants. <laughs> They have three, it's a big group. It's um, you know, $120 billion. They make about $20 billion uh, of profits. Uh, they've got three big business lines. They do toll roads, 10,000 kilometers across the country. They use Internet of Things, sensor technology, an integrated road system. It is cutting edge. They create, they, they make ships. Uh, they launched last year the world's first large uh, container ship, container carrier with sails. So it's a completely green ship. Uh, they also launched the first uh, intelligent ship in the world for ore. Uh, they're in the financial services sector. They've got a whole healthcare ecosystem. They've got a public services ecosystem, which is uh, cutting edge. It's all digitized. It links the bank into the government, so they're very good. Uh, Sinochem is another great example. It's an agriculture uh, 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 chemicals company, uh, the second largest in the world. And uh, their, both the offline and online capabilities to work with farmers is actually very good. So whether it's soil, whether it's plantation types, whether it is efficient the system, they bring technology, they bring research centers, they filed over 200 patents. So everybody's not uh, equally bad. Uh, nevertheless, there's large parts of the state-owned sector, as you know, which is uh, overcapacity, there are too many people employed, and they need to change. Now, can it be done? Ju Rongji took a stab at this 20 years ago and in the late 90s. And uh, when he did, he let a lot of people go, he let a lot of jobs go to fundamentally try and restructure and reform the state-owned uh, enterprise sector. I think today it's actually even more likely that you could do it than 20 years ago. 
because the, pop, the, the employment problem is less of a problem for China today than it used to be, simply because of the demographics. So there are fewer people coming into the workforce, it's an aging workforce, so the job loss situation is actually not as uh, difficult as it used to be. Uh, so it requires some will, but I think the administration has the will uh, to try and do it. This is why they're doing it, except you don't do it. I think they're really worried about Russia. They don't want to create a Russia situation where you throw the baby out with the bathwater. So they're trying to do it in a calibrated way. You retain social stability while you try to create some degree of a reform. So it's a slow process. It's not something that satisfies people like us looking outside in, including in our own sector. But I think it's a deliberate process. I'll quickly ask Rima and come to Freya. Is do you compete with state players, and oh, do you yeah. feel they have unfair advantages? Oh yeah, we, we have the different kind of uh, mixing relationship with the state-owned company. You know, we compete with them. Some of our suppliers state-owned company. Some of our uh, uh, um, franchise network is also state-owned. Um, I never work for a state-owned company myself, but uh, I have no problem because uh, most of company we work with, uh, they are very market-driven. You know, uh, they are, uh, I agree what uh, Pierce said. Uh, probably 20 years ago, 10 years ago, the state-owned company. Uh, uh, um, purpose would be uh, hiring a lot of people, but now they're different. I think they have also had, uh, I know they have also very clear KPI for driven for the probabilities. So uh, as long as they are a uh, very market-driven type of company, um, we compete with them, we uh, work with them, and uh, I have, uh, actually, I'm, uh, we are quite glad that uh, some of the state-owned company as our supplier, uh, financially they are very strong, and uh, the, the team has been uh, uh, working in the market for so many years, so they, they have a lot of uh, market-driven mindset uh, helping us. Um, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the competition we are facing, uh, not the state-owned company, it's more multinationals when they come into China. Chinese market, for at least for automotive, is too open. It's very open. Probably the most open market in the world, if you're looking, talking about the, the car industry, right? We have uh, all the brands, we have all the technology, we have all the company on, uh, in China. So uh, we, we uh, compete with them. And Freya, well, how do you see the reform of Chinese <coughs> sector? If I can kind of segue, segue into that by picking up on one, one point that um, Piyush was, was making about how exports have <coughs> sorry, fallen as a, as a share of, of, of GDP and, and trying to drill down into why that is and, and how that relates to the, to the debt um, problem. Um, as I see it, the renminbi became overvalued in around 2012, and if you look at it on a relative labor costs basis, um, and it's that that has curtailed China's ability to, to continue growing by, by grabbing market share, and also has helped to bring down um, exports as a percentage of GDP. But nothing really changed in terms of the underlying drivers of the Chinese economy and the, the propensity of the Chinese economy to continue saving a very large percentage of, of the overall income in, in each uh, period. And if you have a large flow of savings and you can't send it abroad in the form of, of exports, you can't find a willing borrower in the rest of the world, you have to internalize that process of, of saving. That process, there has to be a, a, a deficit internally to match the surpluses that, that arise from the flow of, of savings. So this is where we see the massive kink up in, in, in Chinese debt as a percentage of, of GDP in actually in 2011, and, and that's around when I think the, the renminbi went into overvaluation territory. And more recently, we've started to see Chinese companies trying to deleverage, partly thanks to the, to the, the official efforts to push that deleveraging, but the history shows us that once um, that deleveraging process begins, it's very hard to, to reverse it, that, that corporations have sort of felt, uh, reached their pain threshold, and politically there's been a shift from the old guard polluting um, over-indebted firms towards the new Made in China 2025 firms. Um, on our calculations, the, the amount of debt that in, is, is still in that, uh, that over-indebted sector and that, that um, sector that has relied too much on debt previously, uh, the way I think about it is, is evergreening. Um, uh, the outflow of, of interest payments compared with the, with the operating cash flow. And if you, if you can't finance your interest payments from operating cash flow, then that means that you must be relying on new capital to pay your interest on previous loans. That amounts to about 13 to 26% of GDP on, on our calculations. Now, how that figures into, into, um, figures into the, the innovation story is that if China chooses to write off enough of those debts, then I think we can, we can release the capital that is held in those, those 
firms that are um, evergreening their debt, and that can flow to the new technology um, companies, and that will help to, to improve um, productivity. But if China chooses to keep uh, write-offs uh, low and, and to sweat off that debt by running financial surpluses, um, that's the Japanese model, and that ends up really basically in a government deficit that, that, uh, that really stunts growth and, and productivity over, over a much longer period. Thank you. Um, we are, have to be very uh, careful about the time. That's fascinating discussion. So I'll open up the floor to uh, take questions from the audience. But before we do that, I was told we can do a survey <coughs> here. So the question is, is China the new champion of capitalism? Take out your phone and vote yes or no. <laughs> a is yes, B is no. Is China the new champion of capitalism? And should we see the result now or later? We have to wait a little bit, right? Yeah, we, we'll wait a little bit, but now I think we can start taking questions from the floor. And uh, please raise your hand and uh, quickly identify yourself. <coughs> the gentleman in the middle. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm Peter. Uh, I'm very much not an economist. Um, so yesterday, we talked a lot about purpose, and my question is, what is the purpose driving the economic policy of China, and how does that impact the rest of the world? Who wants to uh, take that question first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one way that we can encapsulate that in quite a short period of time, seeing as we're, we're, we're restrained, is to, is to recognize that China has been a country that has very much focused on, on GDP targeting. Um, and that was in the local government, how you progressed up the career chain. If you hit your GDP targets or exceeded your GDP, GDP targets, almost regardless of the environmental or, the, or the, the cost in terms of bad debt, you moved up the value-added chain. Uh, you, mo value -added chain. <laughs> you moved up the, up the, up the career ladder. Um, now what we see is that there's a much greater focus on uh, environmental targets. And this is visible in the, the data that we look at, the, the real GDP estimates that, that we look at. Um, in terms of, of, of targeting of PM 2.5 concentrations, for instance, and the production shutdowns that are, are, the, are, are necessary to hit those, those concentrations. So it's, it's a shift in terms of, of, um, of moving from just solely focusing on that narrow national accounts GDP targeting towards the, the environmental targeting. Whether they'll be successful or not is, is a bigger, bigger question, but in the last couple of years, it certainly has made an impact in the data. At a, at a different level. <coughs> I have to say that the Chinese government, like every other government, is focused on increased prosperity for us people. And the truth is that they've done an extraordinary job. Between 1981 and 2012, the 500 million people who were lifted out of poverty, extreme poverty, in that one country alone. More than any other country in the history of civilization, they were able to make a shift in four short decades. Now, that is the agenda of the Chinese government. How do you continue to create prosperity? They want to make sure that they get rich before they get old. So they're really trying to cut, increase the pace because they recognize the demographic challenge they have. So they're trying to increase the pace of economic development so they don't get caught in the middle income trap and continue to drive that uh, prosperity for the citizens. The big shift in the last two, three years has been what Priya said. I think three years ago, it was growth at any cost. I think today they're beginning to realize that there are other consequences and they're looking at a more balanced kind of growth. So President Sheen is... Um, uh, this has been quite clear, quality of growth relative to quantity of growth, which is why letting the GDP targets fall, but trying to make sure that you have greater environmental and other considerations in the quality of growth is uh, now very clearly state policy. I, yeah, I think the, uh, I agree with the previous, the, uh, uh, when I returned to China, uh, my premier employer said, you know, although you speak Chinese, you grow up, uh, I left China when I was uh, 20, 21 years old, but you don't know China because, um, you know, we spend most of our time in tier one cities. You know, if you go down to the tier two, m tier four, tier five cities, uh, you know the local government is really, their first priority in, on the agenda is trying to make people live better, you know, uh, out of their poverty. Um, the, the biggest issue with China, uh, I'm not sure if you have been, ever been to the tier four, tier five cities, the gap is huge. You know, uh, if you go to Shanghai, Beijing, it's not the, the typical part of the, so the gap used to be huge. I think the most part of the local government was working really aggressively to make the gap 
smaller, and then uh, um, uh, you have, you know, the, the media probably will report a lot of the uh, uh, small uh, problems, but uh, I would say 90% of the uh, village leader, the, the township leader, their first priority is trying to make their people living better, make more money, you know, and then uh, as long as it's not out of range, um, they encourage you to do the business, and as long as you hire people and make them re uh, um, living better, um, so I, I, I would say that uh, uh, GDP is just uh, one of the KPI. Uh, but on the other hand, the most uh, of the, uh, uh, the leadership at the local government level are trying to very hard to make their people be better. So when they get promoted, they are very proud that uh, I was uh, head of certain uh, tier four city. I make the people live better. Yeah, so prosperity and also prosperity with more meaning in that. And the gentleman over there? We have sh a short period of time, so I would like to take probably three questions in total, and then we can answer them together. Yes, please. I'm Sudhir from India. As we know, the question was, is China the champion of capitalism? And here we have some panelists saying, we are now trying to reduce the difference between the rich and the poor. So is it heading back to socialism? And in that case, will it reduce the growth? Mm. Well, uh, can I say first? Can we take three questions? Because yeah. we have only three minutes left. Because so I have a strong feeling for that question. Uh, <laughs> okay. it, really depends, it really depends where you live, where's your experience. You know, I spend a lot of time in the US, and then I spend a lot of time in Sweden. And then uh, it's, it's all comparable. You know, how you compare? You know, uh, if you had only US experience, you'd probably say, uh, not really, um, US. And, uh, but if you spend a lot of time in uh, Sweden, you say, yeah, China probably more capitalism than Sweden. So it really depends on your experience, and uh, it's all comparable. And uh, that's my little um, giveaway for that. So the gentleman over there. I'm also Modi from India. This is to Mr. W.W. W. Motors. I'm the automotive business. We're doing electric mobiles in India with Toyota and Isuzu. Do you think you Chinese will beat us much more? And when the mobility comes, what will happen to the petroleum companies in the Middle East? Will they go bankrupt? What will happen to those economies? Is that for me also? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess it's for you. But let's take one yeah. last question, um, probably from the gentleman over there, and then uh, we'll uh, have the answers and quickly wrap up. Yes, yes please. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Andre from Hong Kong. So uh, I think that the question is for everyone on the stage. So uh, how do you see the, uh, especially return need of Chinese overseas back to China? How would that, how would you think the influence of the overseas Chinese back to China would influence the policies and all, economic policy and also the capital uh, management in China itself? Okay, talent question. So um, yes, quickly have a round of answers on the panel. Can I uh, respond to the first question um, about is China moving Back to back to socialism to tackle these problems of, of inequality. Um, for me, it's not so much a, a dichotomy between socialism and, and capitalism. And incidentally, I think China is absolutely not the capitalist champion. Just for just for the record. <laughs> it, it is. No, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. No, he, he no, go with the sixty-four percent. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no. It's, 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 this is up. No, it's no, it, definitely yeah. not. Um, a call, an ex colleague of mine, a mentor of mine, used to describe. Um, Japan, but the same applies to, to China as um, as as uh, not uh, capitalism with beauty spots, but communism with warts. It's not a very flattering <laughs> description, and it's perhaps not a, a fair fair characterization. But it's not it's not capitalism. In terms of whether they have to move back towards something that might be defined as, as socialism to deal with these inequalities, I think the inequalities that have to be addressed are about imbalanced income flows between the household sector and the corporate sector. Yes, the co the household sector saves a lot, um, and that's because of uncertainty and the hukou system and a whole host of reasons why they might have a high savings rate. Um, but but the underlying income flowing to the household sector in the first place is, is, is deficient as a percentage of the overall um, economy. And that's really about financial repression. It's also about, um, get it, or it's about getting the, the, the returns of capital um, from the, the corporate sector out into the, into the household sector where they can actually be spent. And that's the, the major difference between um, the, the, the Chinese economy structure and the, the the, the structure of the US. We don't have time, but I, I want to just say one, one more thing on, on, on that point. Um, 
as to whether it, inequality is, is purely solved by, um, by more socialist ways of looking at things, um, and that certainly play, plays a role in terms of the, the role of the welfare state. Um, but a lot of inequality going forward, not just in China, is going to be generated by um, rent-seeking behavior, and particularly the rents, the economic rents that are derived by, um, but derived from network effects. As networks build and, and the role of networks are become much more important, um, and the, the, the flows from that will go to disproportionately some sector of society. That, to my mind, is definitely not a capitalist system either. So this is this is the, the whole idea of, of it only just being a socialist. Um, answers is is perhaps not not quite right. Yes, push quickly. Well, you know, Deng Xiaoping famously said, uh, "It doesn't matter what color the cat is, as long as it catches yeah. mice." And yeah. I think that's relevant um, in the context of this question because is China capitalistic? Well, if you go by uh, Professor Ferguson's definition, private ownership of capital, that's not only not uh, uh, true today; it's not going to be. They're quite clear they're going to have the state be a very active participant. I personally don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. I come from Singapore, where that model has worked quite well. Uh, are you uh, is you, are you leaving uh, a allocation of capital to market forces? Well, not exactly. That's why you have all this ineffective and inefficient allocation of capital to overcapacity industries. So they're not quite there yet. Uh, do you have free market access and liberalization? Well, no, not exactly, because they still have a lot of uh, limitations for market access and market controls and so on. So you, couldn't, uh, you can argue it's certainly not a capitalistic uh, society. On the other hand, all the gains that China has made in the last 10, 15 years, they are private sector propelled. And there's a lot of money in China, there's a lot of venture capital money in China, there's a lot of private equity in China, and there's a lot of talent in China. So to your question, there are about two million and change uh, Chinese uh, students who are back in the country. Uh, with strong STEM degrees, uh, good research backgrounds, and many of them are driving some cutting-edge work in many of the leading companies in China. If you go to Shenzhen today, or you walk into the office of Huawei, it's just actually quite impressive, uh, the quality of talent and the kind of work they're doing. So they are bringing talent in. And so if, you know, if that is the definition of capitalism, do you have good talent, do you have money, can money be put to work, can you create productive enterprise, well, then you'd argue they are capitalistic. So it doesn't matter what label you give, it, give them, the fact is they're being quite effective. Thank you, and Freeman, you have last word. It's time is up. Time is up, but uh, people like you, like oh, the Oh, yeah, talking about India, I spent quite a few time in India. We uh, used to work Just for Tata. Just very Tata's, quickly, though. Mr. <laughs> Tata, Mahindra, Mahindra. I think uh, India, uh, it's already one of the largest country for producing the, the small compact car, and uh, it will continue to grow up uh, as long as the uh, infrastructure getting uh, the right direction, I think. Uh, but on the other hand, I think India is still quite focused on the uh, ICE, internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, Middle East, yeah, they, uh, there's quite a few uh, uh, big investors in the Middle East start concerning about the, uh, the future of the oil, and uh, they start making big investment in the electric vehicle sectors now. So I think that's a right direction for as a hedging strategy, right? Thank you. I, our time is up, the discussion but just, just got started. So uh, please join me in thanking all our participants and speakers on the stage and those of you with the good questions. Thank you.